Madison is News, the official podcast of Princeton University's James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. I'm your host, Annika Nordquist. Joining us today from California is Professor Ian Morris, the Jean and Rebecca Willard Professor of Classics and Professor in History at Stanford University. In 2011, he wrote Why the West Rules for Now, which won a slew of awards, was named as one of the books of the year by publications ranging from Foreign Affairs to the New York Times, and has been translated into 13 languages. Today, we're here to discuss his most recent book, which I can personally attest is just as gripping, Geography is Destiny, Britain and the World, a 10,000-Year History, a book he wrote in the wake of Brexit. We recorded this discussion actually shortly before the death of Queen Elizabeth, and in her wake, I think a discussion of the history of Britain and her empire is all the more timely. Lastly, I should perhaps disclose that I had the very great honor of studying with Professor Morris during my undergraduate years, and I hope that you enjoy this discussion as much as I did his lectures. And with no further ado, let's dig in. Ian, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me on. Uh, I want to kick off this interview because uh, I think there's kind of an elephant in the room, uh, which is the title of your book, Geography is Destiny. Uh, and I call it an elephant in the room because in certain circles, that's a pretty controversial statement. Uh, and it brings immediately to mind Marx's thought about how economics can be a sole driver of history and also debates about, for instance, the merit of the great man theory of history uh, mm-hmm. in which history is driven completely by particular individuals. So before we kind of get buried in the weeds of what your book is about, I want to start by asking you with what does destiny mean in your title? Is there room for human agency in history? Yeah, well, I think that's that's kind of the the thing that I really wrote the book to try to explore. I'd written Mm. a series of books going back about 10, 15 years now trying to scale up and look at the whole of human history across tens of thousands of years and say, are there big patterns that we can see? And if there are, um, can we predict where the big patterns might take us next? And if we can, can we also predict what kind of forces might disrupt these patterns and lead history to go off down a completely unexpected direction, which yeah, goodness knows it's done that plenty of times in the past. So I'd written these books, um, scaling up and looking at bigger and bigger things. But all the time while I was writing, there's this little sort of prof- professional historian voice in my head keeps saying well yes okay this is what you're, you're having a lot of fun doing this this is all well and good but actual history is of course made by real people on the ground people living their lives living with the consequences of what they do if your grand theories can't actually make sense of something concrete that's happened then are they really any use to anybody so i've been thinking for a few years you know, what i should do is take something fairly specific and try to apply these grand theories to it and ask you, is this actually helping us understand something that really happened? And so anyway, I'm I'm thinking about these ideas and then along comes June of 2016 and the citizens of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland in their wisdom decide they're gonna vote to leave the European Union. And I wake up the next day and like a lot of people, I'm a little bit surprised by that result. You know, we all knew it was gonna be a close vote in the referendum, but the actual outcome, Mm -hmm. I thought it would be like the the vote over Scottish devolution a couple of years earlier, the the last minute it will be clawed back to the status quo, but it wasn't. And so it just becomes Mm -hmm. very obvious to me, oh, like this is like a perfect, test case for these grand theories does looking at a big chunk of time and um, does that help you understand what actually happened here and if it does yeah what, what does it tell us like you were asking what does it tell us about human agency and the interplay between these vast impersonal forces of geography and the sort of very important persons living on the ground and so, yeah, you won't be surprised to hear I decided that the, the big picture, of course, does tell us something about what happened. <laughs> I wouldn't have written right. a book otherwise. <laughs> uh, and, but so, yeah, it led me into thinking a lot more about exactly this question. Um, so, OK, so geography is destiny in some sense. I think everybody would agree in some sense geography is destiny. Then the question becomes, well, how how far is it destiny and what exactly does hmm. destiny mean? And so that in a sense, that's what the book's about. And you start, so you're talking about this debate that goes on over the course of Britain's history. And you start this debate 10,000 years ago, as you say in your subtitle, which I think to most people, most people interpret that as just sort of a a synonym for a really, really long time, like longer than I really understand. Um, But I know you, and I've read your book, and I know you've thought more carefully about it than just subbing in a long time for a specific number. 
So what exactly happened 10,000 years ago that leads you to begin your discussion of this debate here? Yeah, well, of course, I mean, you, you're quite right. When 10,000 is a very well-established expression for just a, a lot. Like the ancient yeah. Greeks, <laughs> as you know, you see the myriados, which you know, literally means 10,000, but actually just means a lot. But in this case, there is a, a reason for that specific number. That That's the point about 10,000 years ago. It's the point when um, after the Ice Age ends and the glaciers start melting, sea levels start rising, that's the point when the British Isles begin to be physically separated from the continent of Europe. And that, I realized as I started thinking about these problems, that is really what the whole issue is about. Because like the whole of British history has been driven by these two geographical facts. One of them being that the British Isles are islands, and not surprisingly, British Isles are islands. So insularity is an important part of the story. But the other part of the story is that they're only just islands. And it's only just over 20 miles to get from Dover to Calais. It's only about a dozen miles or so to get from Scotland to Ireland. They are islands, but they're very, very close to the European mainland. And I realized that the whole of this 10,000 year story admittedly in ways that change, but still the whole of the story is driven by the back and forth between these two principles, insularity and proximity. And this sort of issue about you know, real people interacting with the vast impersonal forces, the way it played out is all the time, um, People have to come to terms with the fact that they are living on islands, but these islands are very close to Europe. Which of these two geographical facts are we going to um, sort of lean toward? Which are we going to embrace? And it's like British history, in a sense, has been this 10,000 year argument over these two principles. And of course, once you start looking at it like that, then, well, yes, of course, Brexit makes complete sense. It's not like um, you know, the way some people saw Brexit was it, it was this, you know, this moment of madness where you know, yokels with pitchforks drag the British off the cliff <laughs> into the pit of darkness. And which, looking at it in the long-term way, well, no, that's just plain ridiculous. And of course, then other people look at it and say, well, joining the European Union, 1973, that was the moment of madness when you know, effete, snobbish elites who like to sit around drinking claret drag the sturdy British yeomanry into the European Union and lie about the whole thing. And so now 2016 is about getting rid of that moment of madness. And neither of those points of view is true. Um, you can trace, at least in principle, going back 10,000 years, how this debate has worked out. And you can actually trace it in writing back two thousand years to Tacitus and you know, writes the first extended surviving discussions of the British on, and as the Romans conquer them. And already these arguments are absolute front and center in Tacitus's account. So yeah, it's a, it, it all goes back a really long way, kind of right to the beginning of the story. Yeah. So I mean that brings to mind just there was a really amazing quote in your book. You say since antiquity, Europhiles have dreaded being dragged into the abyss by peasants with pitchforks while Europhobes have resented being told what to do by cliques of know-it-alls. And so it's just, it's such a funny parallel, um, you know, as someone who is familiar with both Roman and British history, who's enjoyed studying both, you do draw a really interesting parallel between the way that Britons talked about their relationship to Rome and the way that, that Britons now talk about their relationship to Europe. So can you Talk me through a little bit how those debates were taking place and uh, how those debates changed kind of over the course of Roman history. Because initially, of course, Britain did not voluntarily join mm -hmm. Rome in the same way that it did the EU. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, thinking about this, I mean, with most of the books that I've written, this becomes kind of the, the central organizational intellectual problem in the book is how do you think about the way these vast long-term forces that most of us most of the time are not really that aware of them in, for what they really are, how, how those influence the way we behave and the way we think about the world and the, the decisions that we take. And um, it did seem to me looking back over the long run of British history, these forces of proximity and insularity, these really have driven a huge amount of what's happened. I mean, not everything, of course, but a huge amount of what's happened. And yet, when you look at what people are actually saying about things, so going back, you know, again, you can go back 2000 years to the Roman period, or you could look at what they were saying in 2016 in the Brexit debates, hardly anybody actually talks about geography, even though it seems to me glaringly obvious, geography, the meanings of geography and how these are changing, that's what's driving the problems of the time. What people actually talk about, which of course makes complete sense when you think about it, you don't talk about this deep 
hidden force driving the story along. What you talk about is the way the deep hidden forces impact you in your everyday life. And so very little discussion of proximity and insularity, but um, going all the way from the, the, the Britons that Tacitus was talking about right through to Nigel Farage in 2016, they all talk about the same five things. Um, this, um, the, the five issues, and Farage actually identified these five issues, but then you see them going back way, way into the past. So identity is one of them. And these are all they're sort of conceived in normative terms. So it's not like you're actually asking a factual question about who are the British people. It's more who should the British people be and who should not be British people. So identity is one of them. Mobility is another. You know, who should be moving around and do we like the way it currently is? Prosperity is the third. And how much wealth do we want to have and how should it be distributed? Um, security mm. is the fourth of these things. You know, how much violence should there be? Who should be in charge of the violence? What can be done? about this and then finally sovereignty you know who should be in charge in the british isles and these five forces they sort of bounce off each other and the debates you see um in the surviving written sources are all about these five forces rather than the underlying force of geography but then when you look at the big picture you see that it's kind of the, the changing meanings of geography over time are mm. what have driven the precise kind of arguments about identity mobility prosperity security and sovereignty so it's like it's a one long story where really nothing ever changes for ten thousand years and yet at the same time it's a completely different story where the um on the ground outcome looks completely different at every point. And you've alluded several times to the changing meanings of geography, which is a big theme of your book. And I'd like to really draw it out and talk about it a little bit more because Britain has had kind of this bell curve, I guess, history, right? It, it was a backwater for a long time. And then it rose to just fantastic prominence, the largest kind of unified uh, political force the world history has ever seen still. And then, now it's, you know, it's still a serious major power, but it's sort of been overtaken by the U.S. and China in terms of like true global preeminence. So what about, obviously it's geography has remained the same, but what about the meaning of geography has changed over the course of time to produce that kind of curve of history? Yeah, well, th this, again, this is something I spend a lot of time in my books thinking about yeah. this. because um, <laughs> It's a big one. Yeah, when, when it first started to, to occur, to, I wrote a book called Why the West Rules for Now that came out in 2010. Yeah. And that was really yeah. about you know, why did this relatively small group of nations around the shores of the North Atlantic in the last 200 years basically take over the whole planet in a way no one had ever done anything like this before. And when I started writing that book, I, I kind of, I, I tend to be very impetuous when I'm writing books. I just charge into them, <laughs> make a few notes on the back of an envelope, <laughs> think, ah, I got it all figured out, in I go. And I get uh, like a chapter so in and realize, oh boy, do I not know what I'm talking about here i'm so over my head here and so it was while i was writing that book it gradually dawned on me the further i got into that book i realized oh you know everything i'm discussing in this book i seem to end up saying geography is the important thing here mm. and so then it dawned on me i need to go back to the start and read the introduction and actually say this um but <laughs> i also kept thinking well how can that be the case that we've seen these great shifts in the distribution of global wealth and power? How can that be if geography is actually the driver? Because like you say, because once the coastlines and everything starts settling down after the Ice Age by about 6000 BC, the geography hasn't changed that much. I mean, climate and things obviously have seen significant changes, but mm. the physical geography hasn't changed that much. So why, if geography is a driver, is the outcome such a mess? And so history is, is so complicated. And um, I, this is, again, one of these things, the minute you start thinking about it, the answer becomes very obvious. Of course, geography is driving history and history is complicated, but that's because geography is also complicated. The, the, ge the physical geography stays much the same, but what it means for people changes enormously over time. Um, yeah. And all kinds of different things change what the geography means. We say the, the classic case, again, British example, you know, through most of its history, Britain is this group of islands that are basically a big lump of coal with a bit of soil scattered thinly on the surface. <laughs> and they're stuck out into the North Atlantic Ocean, which is a terrible place to be. It rains all the time. And so it's not surprising Britain is a backwater forever and ever. But then, you know, about 200, 250 years ago, British cracked the secret of using fossil fuels to power engines that can drive just about anything. Then all of a sudden, living on top of a lump of coal turns out to be a really good <laughs> thing. Geography abruptly changes its meaning. Sticking out into the Atlantic Ocean means you've got um, direct access to the most important sea lanes in the world. The, the, the geography flip-flops very, very abruptly. And so that, that's the sort of 
driving force in the story and the new book, Geography's Destiny, that um, through most of its history, British Isles, they're basically, they're, they're the end of the world. So they're the levels of technology you've got, you know, the Atlantic Ocean, basically the Atlantic is an impassable barrier. So you're the edge of Europe. The English Channel, um, you know, through most of history, uh, nobody, no military people ever talked about naval warfare in the way that we all do today. We always talk about control of the seas, command of the oceans. That was unthinkable, unimaginable concept until about the years 1500, 1600. Before that, anything that comes to one side of the English Channel can get to the other side, whether that's microbes or missionaries or merchants or soldiers, doesn't matter. Once they get to uh, once they get to Calais, they're coming to Dover if they feel like it. And there's nothing anybody can do to stop that. And so the, the great centers of wealth and power and innovation, these are through most of history, these are off down in the Mediterranean, the Middle East, India, China. And so, you know, simplifying very crudely, but basically British history, it's about stuff rolls downhill from the great centers, the great hills up in the Middle East and places like that, rolls downhill, comes northwest across Europe, gets to the English Channel, it can always cross the English Channel, whatever it is, crosses the English Channel. English history is about dealing with what comes its way from the continent. Scottish, Welsh and Irish history is about dealing with what come their way from England. And that is the basic story. And there are huge permutations between 8000 BC and 1500 AD, you know, Henry VIII coming on the throne. And a lot has changed in between, of course. Yeah. But the basic story actually really hasn't changed um, and what changes it is this technological and organizational revolution you get with Henry, Elizabeth, um, and particularly the 17th century rulers. So you've now got ships, these galleons, they can stay at sea for months at a stretch. You actually can close the channel now if you really, really want to do it, build enough ships. You can blockade Spanish fleets in their harbours, stop them crossing the English Channel, because the English get away with this in 1588 with the Armada. But that's actually more by luck than anything. It's not until well into the 17th century that they really figure out how to do it. You can do this, and you can build ships that will cross the Atlantic Ocean pretty reliably, some sink, of course, but pretty reliably, open up this global network of trade. You can do this if you want to. And that's kind of the big thing that, um, in addition to the technological revolution, you've got to have an organizational revolution to make this possible. You've got to have governments powerful enough to pay for these fleets, which means, of course, governments strong enough to put their hands in your pocket and take all the money out. Otherwise, right. they can't do it. And, you know, not surprisingly, <laughs> then as now, not everyone is thrilled with tax and spend governments. <laughs> and so there's a lot of resistance to this. And also governments that will give power and influence to merchants who are like the scummiest people imaginable <laughs> to most of the landed aristocracy. A lot of people really don't like this. And in a lot of ways, the English Civil War in the 17th century, these, these wars, they are largely about this question of what kind of government do we want to have here? Um, and like a lot of these bitter ide ideological disputes, the, I mean, if there is anything funny about the English Civil War, which was not a funny thing at all, but if there <laughs> is anything kind of funny about it, it's how it sort of didn't matter in a way who won because the yeah, parliament and the crown, they both come to more or less the same conclusion. We've got to have some way to raise large amounts of money, build great big fleets, really put the weight of the nation behind the merchants. And it's like we're making a decision. We're going to stop trying to be a first rate European power. We're going to distance ourselves from Europe as much as we can. And instead, we're going to become a first rate global power. And our only interest in Europe is basically to be troublemakers, because like the, the British nightmare becomes the idea that one one continental power, Spain, Spain or France or Germans, eventually uh, Soviets might come to dominate the whole continent, got no serious rivals there and can concentrate on building fleets that will challenge the English at sea and break their power. So governments in London become interested in Europe solely to make trouble. And they come up with this concept, a very famous concept, the balance of power, that um, we're not interested in winning wars on the continent. We just want to make sure nobody else wins. <laughs> um, and so any time there's a power or a coalition that looks strong enough to dominate the continent, we throw our weight in against them. It doesn't matter who they are. We can be friends with the, the, the Muslim Turks if we need to be. If that's what it'll do to stop the French becoming top dog, 
we'll do that. So the, the complete strategic revolution in British thinking. And um, so this is this, this thing about you know, the role of agency, because like geography, the changing meanings of geography provide these opportunities to British leaders in the 17th century, but they don't have to take advantage of them. If the Civil War had gone differently, they might well not have done. Britain would have become one of several competing European powers, all with a significant stake overseas, but would not have become this global giant, colossus, that it does become. So they embrace this vision of the world, this um, London-centric maritime vision, for about 200 years, about 1700 to 1900. And um, it's, it's a heck of a scramble, but they make it work. It's very difficult. They're constantly fumbling, but they make it work. Britain becomes the richest, most important, powerful country in the world, which really is you know, against all the odds. And I don't think anybody would have predicted that in 8,000 BC. <laughs> um, so they, they do that. But then it's like the same things that sort of push the British to the top of the heap, then push them off again in the 20th century, or the mm. late 19th, 20th centuries, that the world continues shrinking as technology keeps improving, organisations get bigger and bigger. You know, Britain is dominating the North Atlantic and from there a global economy centred on London. Um, in order to make money off it, you've got to have people able to buy your goods. So it's kind of in the interest of the British, because this is a very contemporary debate as well over free trade, right. it's in the interest right. of the British to see the Americans and Germans getting richer buying more british railroads and all, all this kind of stuff making the british richer and richer which succeeds spectacularly well but of course it also turns the americans and the germans into these rivals and 20th century britain of course succeeds in seeing off the, these two gigantic german challenges staying above the germans but only does so by putting itself under the wing of the americans and this is a, a debate they have very explicitly in british leadership circles at the end of the 19th century what do we want to do here we can't we realize we cannot keep running the world the way we've been running it so what is the lesser of the various evils on the table and again it's hard not to think of some contemporary analogies here with your us other countries thinking what do we do about the rise of China? Right. So uh, the, the British find themselves by 1945. The old system simply can't work anymore. They've got to figure out a new way to do things. They come up with this idea of we will be kind of the Americans' first point of contact between the US and Europe. We'll be in Europe, but not in Europe. And so they join the European Union after various right. <laughs> slightly ridiculous <laughs> messes. They join the European Union. And then it actually, I think it, I think it did work quite well for a couple of decades and what undid it was the fall of the soviet union because mm. like the minute the soviets are off the map britain's importance to the united states it, it just changes again geography changes its meaning once the soviets are gone and of course it's decisions made in washington dc that matter now more than ones made in london and the british suddenly start to realize in the 1990s you know oh we really are just another european country and we don't want to be that. And it really, really upsets some sectors of the British population, the identity, sovereignty kind of issues, compounded by mobility, concerns about security and prosperity. You know, it all sort of feeds in off each other. I think that it's like this debate has been going on really since at least 1989 probably 1973, probably the late 1950s, really. I mean, it's the old Dean Acheson line about Great Britain has lost an empire and not yet found a role. I think that really has been the story for the British since the war. Having seen all these really old grand strategies fall by the wayside, partly because they were so successful, but they fall by the wayside. What do we put in its place? What is the big question? Is the big question how do we position ourselves relative to Europe? Or is it how do we position ourselves relative to the Americans? Mm. Or is it how do we position ourselves relative to the Chinese? And my, my guess at the end of the book, my guess is that when historians look back on Brexit 50, 60 years from now, what they will ask is, how did this position the British relative to the rise of Chinese yeah. power? That is going to become the big question. Yeah, there's a, a lot of really interesting stuff to discuss there. And I'm particularly interested by your analysis that Britain was kind of defeated by its own success. And I want to follow up, I guess, that sort of leads very directly to asking more about the British Empire. Uh, because one of the interesting things is you've kind of just discussed how the British Empire's dissolution had to do kind of with security in the rise of World War II. But in fact, the British Empire seemed as though it was kind of in the process of or ripe to dissolve before, certainly before World War II broke out, but even arguably there were cracks before World mm -hmm, War I. Yes. And I'm wondering, kind of given your thesis uh, about how geography can kind of impact that, 
what is the role of geography in explaining that? Did the meaning of geography change in such a way that having a global empire was no longer advantageous? Yeah, I think that that really is the bottom line on this. Um, there's a great book written by a historian called John Darwin, this book called Unfinished Empire. And the thesis of this is that the British, um, the empire is just, it's sort of thrown together ad hoc, you know, because there's this famous line about creating the empire in a fit of absent-mindedness, which you know, like most of these sort of taglines, <laughs> that's absolutely ridiculous. And yet there's this grain, that's a little element of truth in there as well. So the empire- I mean, <laughs> the Roman empire, if anything, it was more ad hoc and also more famous. Uh, I, are there empires that are not ad hoc? Well, I think that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, there's very little conscious planning in these things. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this has been thrown together, these absurd um, variety yeah. and complexity of things going on. And um, it, it is interesting. You, you get reading books about the British Empire. And you know, I, I grew up in Britain. And um, there, you know, there were some people who were passionately opposed to the empire and critical of everything it stood for. Some people were very nostalgic and patriotic about the empire. What I think very few of us recognise that the professional historians have always recognized is that the British leadership was always immensely cynical about the empire mm, um, at no point really until actually right until the final stages when it's beginning to go away then people start to get a bit weepy eyed about it um, but at no point during the, the period when the empire really was a profitable concern was anybody anything other than cynical about it and the empire um, worked well like say, say when, when the British starts um, colonizing the east coast of the, of the US in the uh, 17th, 18th centuries. Um, they're very clear in their own minds in the 17th century, especially we're doing this in order to capture markets for trade, to capture raw materials from North America, bring them to London at advantageous prices, sell things to the colonists who can't make it for themselves, and also ship out undesirables, by which they basically meant Irish and poor people, <laughs> and dump them on the other side of the world. And for this, a, a, a militarily controlled empire, an empire of force and violence, this this is what you need for that. And they're very strongly committed to this. And they're very clear about, you know, this is a profit making enterprise. So the British government will never actually fund imperialism. We always leave that to people on the ground. They're gonna to have to figure that out for themselves. Yeah. If you want a colony, you want to turn Pennsylvania into a colony, go ahead, knock yourself out. Here's a Royal Charter. Now just don't come to us with the bills. <laughs> so they're very clear about this kind of thing. And um, eye on the profit at, at all times. And of course, eye on the strategic situation too. Uh, the, um, you know, the North American colonies are a way to keep the Spanish and the French out of these places too. Mm. But any time that starts to change, people are more than willing to throw the whole thing under the bus. And um, we see this again and again and again. Because Adam Smith is the guy who first really points this out. The first volume of um, The Wealth of Nations comes out in 1776, because a year famous for several other things going on. And Smith says, you know, even before the American colonists rebellion split, Smith says, hey, you know what we should do? We should just let those guys go. Um, you know, the, our wealth comes from the size of our markets and the scale of the division of labor and specialization. That's all. It doesn't come from taxing Americans and telling them what to do. Let them go. And they will continue to buy British goods because ours are the best and the cheapest. They will continue to sell their stuff to us, their, their wood and fish and everything, because we will pay the best prices because we've got the best and the cheapest goods. So we're making most money. We all win. And of course, everybody poo poos this, you know, ridiculous academic nonsense. And um, it comes to the end of the American Revolutionary War, and you've got all the you know, guys who really know a lot, like Pitt the Elder, saying, you know, every gentleman in England will sell his estates and move to America now that the Americans have rebelled. And of course, that doesn't happen. And by the end of the 1780s, trade is back to where it was in 1776, and it just keeps going and going. So there's all this wealth being made from this. But Smith sees really early on that um, you don't, you shouldn't be in the empire business necessarily to make money. And we see this coming up again and again and again. And you know, more and more factors start to impinge on this cost benefit calculus. So like by 1922, um, when Ireland is in open rebellion against Britain, fighting in the streets, killings in the countryside, Winston Churchill, of all people, who you think, tend to think of as an arch reactionary imperialist, Winston Churchill says, the only way we can keep Ireland is um, by turning it into a bloodbath, fighting a bit, bitter war with the Irish. It's not worth it. Mm. It's not worth it above all to our reputational cost with the Americans. Um, we should just let the Irish go, even though you know, for like seven centuries at this point, this has been the thing we've been fighting desperately to prevent. Let them go. 
and of course the Irish, of course the Irish were making it very difficult not to let them go. <laughs> the Irish get away, and um, the world doesn't end. Um, because Churchill has very different views about India. He's like the arch imperialist on India, and I, again, like, when I was a kid, I assumed everybody back in the nineteen thirties probably thought like Churchill in Britain. It turns out they didn't. You know, the leader of the Conservative Party, his own party head, said that Winston has gone absolutely mad on India. <laughs> Nobody else thinks the way he does about the Indians. And so they, I mean, they think you know, when the British kind of cut and run in 1947, which was, was a disastrous and disgraceful thing to do um, from India. But it was not something that just suddenly popped up. I mean, a bit like Brexit, it had a long history. And people have been talking very seriously about is it really worth it to hang on in these places that don't want us and make us look bad with our allies? Is it actually paying for itself? And you get this theory it becomes very popular right after World War II that the, the ideal thing to do is you look at these various freedom fighters you've got locked up on the Gold Coast and Kenya and other places. You look at these guys you got in prison and you pick out a couple of good ones, a couple of good natives, they would say, and you anoint these people as no longer being revolutionaries, but now as being nationalists and patriots. And the British will now work with these people. And if those people get in charge after independence, then um, they will be coming to London for capital for their new industries. They'll be coming to London to get advice from businessmen. They will just carry on working with Britain, but Britain won't have to pay for the cost of the empire anymore. Maybe this is actually a good thing. And so you know, it's remarkable how flexible the British were about it and how little um, uproar there was in the 1960s when Labour governments just announced, that's it, we're done. We're no longer going to have a presence east of Suez. We're pulling back out of everything. And it's not like in, in France during the wars in Algeria when it's fighting mm. in the streets in Paris over should we be you know, fighting to the last ditch to save Algeria. British basically said, yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, so it's an extraordinary story. I mean, so yeah, rather long and rambling answer there. But it, it's just such an interesting thing. And I think very much it's the, <clears throat> these changing meanings of geography, changing what the value of the empire is to London. Yeah, I guess I guess to drop back to the ancient world, because it's interesting to hear you characterize the British Empire in that way. And it reminds me kind of of historical, maybe not debates, but discussions about the differences between Roman and Greek ways of imperialism and colonialism and how the Greeks started colonies or even actually, I guess you could say the same about the Carthaginians kind of maybe is a better parallel with the sort of very commercially based kind of colonies that eventually kind of grow and become larger imperial powers unto themselves versus the Romans kind of go out, kill them all, you know, <laughs> and the more kind of classic what people think of when they think like what an emp what empire building means, I guess, would you say that Britain is kind of a combination thereof or of, of those kind of two methods? Because I think I traditionally would have mm -hmm. thought of it more in the vein of the Roman were going off and conquering you. Yeah, well, Roman imperialism is just such an interesting topic. Um, that, uh, I think, again, what we often tend to forget, you know, people outside the, the classics profession will tend to forget, is just how divided Romans were over this. It's because they're golden age of it in the second century BC when they're off looting the Greek world um you've got it's like it becomes a real culture war within the city of Rome within the elite um you know, there are those who say yes of course we want to go out there and plunder the Greek world especially the people who are profiting from the plundering of course we want to plunder the Greek world and of course we want to absorb the Greek world um if that's the way to make most profits out of it then other Romans saying um I mean, actually this is parallels quite closely a lot of the debate in 18th century Britain when the British start getting more involved in India Romans saying becoming imperialists, this will corrupt us. This is this flow of wealth. It's not decent wealth that we've earned for ourselves. And you know, as an 18th century Britain, the, you know, the stereotype image of decent wealth is some guy behind a plow, you know, they're plowing his field somewhere. It's not that sort of thing. This is ill-gotten gains. And um, in the British Parliament, they were talking about Asiatic luxury. It will corrupt our elite, mm. very much what the Romans say. And actually, I guess another close parallel. That's, yeah, a shocking, shocking parallel, yeah. <laughs> well, like the, the US and Mexico in the 19th century. And mm. there was very, very similar arguments about this it becomes fairly clear before the end of the 19th century if the united states wants to annex mexico there's not a lot of people around that are going to be able to stop it um, <laughs> but of course the big pushback especially before the civil war was we'll bring these 
um, sort of imperialist ways of thinking into the country. And this will be this boon to the slave states and it will sort of tear our country apart. So I think these sorts of arguments, um, I would guess that probably the same arguments are going to be there in every empire that's ever been created. Mm. But where the emphasis falls, of course, is going to differ a lot. And so, yeah, with the Greek world and until you get to um, Philip and Alexander um, in the fourth century conquering the Persian Empire, creating gigantic territorial empires, this kind of isn't an option for them. Although on a very small scale, because they do have similar sorts of arguments. And should we be planting small colonies that basically just steal some local people's land and then trade and then get rich that way? Or should we be trying to carve out whole new city states and um, swallow up other city states into the state of Athens? So yeah, I think a lot of the same arguments just keep coming up, but the, the nuances are different in each place. That is really fascinating. And I, I guess to draw this back to, uh, to discussing the EU, in your book, you talk about kind of various iterations of European unions. And we've kind of talked a lot about Rome, which Britain did not enter willingly and also did not exit willingly, interestingly. Um, but the next kind of big one is Rome part two being the Catholic Church. Um, and the Catholic Church in Rome is sort of a more, uh, more exact parallel as you kind of draw out in your book. Britain decides to come in and Britain also decides to leave. Can you talk to me a little bit and explain how that parallel came about? Yeah, well, when I started writing Geography's Destiny, um, people would often ask me, so, OK, you're writing this historical book leading up to, to Brexit. So what are the analogies? What has there been that's happened before that's like Brexit? And a lot of people would say, of course, the exit from the Roman Empire. And for a while in 2016, uh, this is quite a, a big op-ed writer's thing. We'd be talking about this guy Carousius, so otherwise <laughs> nobody's ever heard of Carousius. But in 286 AD, he takes Britain out of the Roman Empire and it gets pulled back in again. But so there'll be a lot of talk about this. Mm. But of course, as you say, that is actually not a very good analogy at all. The Roman Empire, um, whether you think on balance it was a positive or a negative thing for its subjects, it was an empire of violence. It was an empire in the real sense. And anyway, I'd say an empire, an empire is something created by force and maintained by force. And if it ceases to rest on a basis of violence, then it's begun to turn into something else. And the Roman Empire was like that. The British Empire was like that. And I think actually a lot of the, you know, a lot of historians are, have become very, very critical of the British Empire in the last 20 years or so. And I, I think a lot of that is driven by them just forgetting that it, it was an empire. The British Empire was, in fact, an empire. And so when you see it behaving like an empire, you shouldn't be shocked by that finding. Because this is just this is what empires do. They're very violent places. But the EU, of course, EU is not an empire. So when the Greeks take all the euros and lose them down the back of the couch in 2009, <laughs> you know, Angela Merkel does not send the panzers back into, into Athens. I mean, that was just never on the table. So this is a very, very different kind of organisation. And um, my initial thought was, well, you know, this has just got to be analysed on its own terms. There's nothing else really like it. And then it occurs to me, actually, you know, there sort of is. Um, and this, as you were saying, this is the coming of the Roman Catholic Church, coming back to Britain, uh, to, to or to Kent initially, in the year 597. And it's brought not by Julius Caesar and his legions, but by one monk, Augustine, an Italian guy, who's got like 20 some other monks come with him. They are the invading army. And it's a, an empire, it's like an empire, empire of the mind, an empire of goodwill, a kind of soft power basis. So yeah, we, you know, empires, classic empires, these are based on the hard power, of military power, economic power. Um, if you don't do what the empire says, it will hurt you. Either it'll come in and crucify you all, which you know, obviously hurts, or it can exert economic power on you. It can bankrupt you. It can starve you. These are really bad things. Whereas an empire of soft power like the EU uh, or the Catholic Church, for that matter, they don't get you to do what they want you to do by threatening you. They get you to do what they want you to do by making you want to want what they want. <laughs> That's how these things work. And of course, Catholic Church, what can it do to make you want what it wants? Well, it has the fate of your eternal soul in it hands it wants to save your soul from the forces of darkness so you can live in paradise forever and ever shouldn't you want that too wouldn't that be a good idea if the catholics can know how to get that shouldn't you want that too and and this is this is their, their sales pitch basically when they arrive in england they come to these 
pagan Anglo-Saxon kings and say, good news, we can save your eternal soul. <laughs> you just got to sign on the dotted line. And the, the kings take a look at this and they're thinking, of course, they're thinking about identity, mobility, prosperity, security, sovereignty. So they take a look at this and say, well, this is, this is a good deal. Yeah, but there are these other little bits in the small print here, like prosperity. Uh, you're going to come in here and you're going to persuade my noblemen to give you huge chunks of my mm. kingdom uh, in order to get a better deal with God. You'll get monks praying for your soul while you're in purgatory this kind of thing you're going to take over a lot of our prosperity you're going to take over a lot of our sovereignty you're going to have canon law for your people these italians are coming in here you're going to interfere with my attempts to run my kingdom you're going to transform our identity as we go from pagan anglo-saxons to catholics this is a major transformation just everything will change and so like the eu when it gets going after world war ii um this organization, because the EU founded in the Treaty of Rome, it's always Rome, and um, this organization based in Rome is offering a deal to people saying, okay, in this deal, you give up some of your prosperity, security, and the rest. In return, you get back more prosperity. You join the EU, you join the coal and steel um, community initially, you will make so much more money than if you try to trade coal and steel just as France or Belgium or whatever. You give up some of your identity, but you get to be part of a larger, greater identity, the European identity, the, the Catholic Christian identity. Um, sovereignty, yeah, you're giving up some of that, but look at all the stuff you get. If you become a Christian king in Kent, you now start getting invited to the Christian conferences, which you're <laughs> never going to come to if you're pagan. And the conferences are where all the deals happen. You will be offered the hand of a Christian princess in marriage. Now you're joining into these super powerful continental Christian families. That is never going to happen if you stay pagan. We will provide you with educated clerics who can read and write, can organize tax codes for you and raise money other than by just plundering people. You can have an you know, organized systematic taxes within your country your prosperity will start to go up all these things they're offering and one by one um anglo-saxon kings in england start saying you know i think the pluses of joining the original european union catholic church the pluses do outweigh the minuses and they flip-flop a bit like the british with brexit people come and go and they can't make up their mind and all kinds of things go on um but uh, more and more they start joining up and it's like this snowballing thing again very like the eu in modern europe the more um Anglo-Saxon kingdoms that join the Catholic Church, the more advantageous it becomes for you to join and the higher the price comes for staying out. And so it only takes them about 75 years to roll up pretty much the whole of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. And um, that then, this EU thing, this uh, Catholic Church, that really dominates the next thousand years of British history. Because you've got a, si a situation, again, sort of vaguely similar to um, the modern EU, where... Um, People who are Catholics are part of this larger soft power empire, this um, sort of intellectual ideological empire, but they still have governments. They still have hard power broken up into nations within the Catholic world. And so you've got this constant juggling going back and forth um, between uh, the, the, the soft power guys in Rome and the, the hard power guys out in the, the various Catholic countries. And you get a very similar sorts of ideological problems of people trying to run this empire of soft power and particularly the big one is that like, the more successful you are as a pope the harder it becomes to carry on being pope like, the more you're able to tell the king of england to do what you say and the more the king knuckles under and does it the less believable it becomes that you the pope are the heir of jesus and saint peter and have committed yourself to chastity especially the chastity <laughs> thing, poverty these other things which popes are clearly not doing this uh, and so you get these constant uprisings and um, you're know, a bit like the euro skeptics again after the second world war constant uprisings within the church and people trying to leave um leave the church because there's a million differences too but it seemed to me in all sorts of weird and sometimes kind of comical ways these two organizations are rather similar and so I mean, we've kind of covered a huge range of different types of empires or imperial adjacent trade or cultural organizations, I guess, over the course of this talk. We've talked about Rome, we've talked about the papacy, we've talked about the British Empire, but we haven't yet discussed kind of the two modern quote unquote empires, so to speak, like the American empire, uh, which people like Neil Ferguson talk about a lot, if specifically in the terms of empire, but which is sort of more of a soft power, but we happen to have the most hard power type of empire. And then the Chinese kind of rising power, and particularly, which they're trying to uh, use the Belt and Road mm -hmm. Initiative in particular, to kind of beef up 
um, across the world. So how would you say that those two kind of the American empire-ish, which is, is established versus the Chinese who are rising and seem to have pretty clear imperial ambitions, how would you say that those compare and contrast to the mm-hmm. other kinds of empires that we've talked about over the course of this conversation? Yeah, that is a really interesting question. I think it's very hard. If you're doing this kind of history, it's very hard not to keep asking yourself questions like this. And the American empire, um, if, if that's the word we want to use for it, uh, yeah, that, um, well, actually, Neil Ferguson in his book just called Empire, I uh, was one of the guys who really made a big deal about this. The American empire, in so many ways, is like the British empire, but more so in some regards and less so in others. So like, I think that the big thing I would say, the big similarity between the American and British global systems, that's a nice, nice neutral expression, <laughs> global systems, is that both of them are based primarily on commerce and on free exchange, free trade of goods around the world. And on the idea that we make certain things, whether it's goods or services, better than anybody else in the world. And so the way for the United States or Britain to get rich is to lower the tariffs and trade barriers, have as much freedom of movement, freedom of ideas, freedom of everything as possible. Uh, Because we are confident that um, we will always be able to sell more of our stuff than we have to buy of stuff to to keep us going. Like for the British, of course, the big thing was the more they put their resources toward um, fossil fuel industries and the city of London, the less less able they were to feed themselves. They have to buy food from overseas, even though a classic case of comparative advantage, even though it would actually be cheaper to grow the food in Britain. We buy it more expensively from overseas because devoting that land to factories is even more profitable. So that's sort of really strong similarities. And so the British and the US have, uh, at least in their sort of developed global system form, being big champions of free trade and low trade barriers, big champions of maritime power, big champions of at least somewhat popular government generally feeling that will is likely to advance their causes because there the great differences between the two systems um the british system was had just depended so much more on hard power uh, the american system it's sort of weird because the americans the amount of hard power the u.s has at its disposal dwarfs anything the british ever had and I'm talking not just in direct comparison obviously we've got nuclear weapons and they right, didn't right. <laughs> um, so not, not just in relative terms compared to what everyone else on the planet at that time had the americans i mean it, yeah it just there's no comparison here the british were, did everything on a shoestring was scrambling every crisis was a real crisis whereas the u.s can generally we can run two or three crises at the same time we're pretty good like that. <laughs> the british really struggled to do that so the americans have got all this um, hard power they can apply and their financial hard power again just dwarfs anything the british had um but they found a way to run their system generally without using hard power so Mm. directly. The British, right up until the middle of the 20th century, do remain partly committed to the idea that direct colonial rule over parts of the world is going to be a good and profitable thing. And it's only when they look at it really systematically in the late 50s, they realise, yeah, this just doesn't work anymore. And the US, I mean, maybe just through accidents of history, has been fortunate enough largely to avoid that approach to the rest of the world. So I think that, that is, that's the big difference between the two. But in a lot of ways, in so many ways, what the US, I, I think, what US leaders tend to want in the 21st century is not that different from what British leaders tended to want in the 19th century, to keep the global system going on terms of trade that favour the metropolis. Mm. China, though, China is a different sort of beast. And I think what makes it so different, partly, is that it's so hard for us to figure out what the longer term grand strategic aims are. Um, and because partly because the Chinese are very reticent about ever saying this is what we're trying to do, unless it's things like saying we're just trying to make everybody happy. Um, it's difficult for us to figure out where China is going. Um, I think some of the sh- more short term things are fairly obvious, like you know, Chinese leaders have been complaining um, since the Second World War about what they call the island chains, these you know, networks of alliances from Japan down to Australia. They kind of enclose China's access to the oceans and uh, uh, allow Western allies, if they wanted to, to shut China off completely from Pacific trade. So breaking the island chains is, uh, has to be a top priority for Chinese leaders because there's different ways you can do that. I mean, you can drop. 20,000 paratroops on Taiwan. That's one way to do it, which I tend to think is not a very smart way to do it. (laughs) Or you can sort of just carry on doing what you're doing. And um, so, and and actually, this really came home to me about a decade or so ago. I was invited to 
and conference in Australia. When I think the Australians in a lot of ways, Australia is 10 years ahead of the rest of the West on this front. Because hmm. the, the big problem the Australians had discovered was that our strategic partner, our military partner, cultural partner is the United States. Our economic partner is China. There's no ambiguity about this. The Australian economy depends on exporting to China. Um, our grand strategic goal should be to avoid ever having to make a choice between mm. these two partners. And by about 2010, the Australians are beginning to feel a little bit boxed into a corner here, and they are having to make choices. And because we've now seen the last five years or so, Australia is one of the places that has made the Beijing governments angrier than just about anybody, because they've explicitly made their choice clear. And so I think you know, more and more countries in the Pacific are being boxed into that position of having to make their decision and they're trying desperately to avoid making it but I, I think it's not crazy for leaders in Beijing to think that at least some of the countries you know, between Singapore and um, South Korea some of these countries are going to end up choosing China over the United States dissolving the island chains because in you know, another way you, the, the Belt and Road Initiative that you mentioned a lot of strategists look at that and say well yes of course this is about building infrastructure and helping other countries develop as trade partners for China and it is about making money off the loans but it is really really about outflanking um the island chains getting access to the indian ocean and the mediterranean interesting yeah so yeah it's hard to know where they are going to want to go with this um um because i guess i i you know i spent quite a lot of time reading about china thinking about china but i i still was rather taken by surprise by what seemed to me to be a rather dramatic change in Chinese policies right after the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Mm. I think up till then, they very much followed the old Deng Xiaoping uh, sort of recommendation. You just keep your head down, bide your time, everything will come to you. Then it was like 2009, the circle of people around Xi Jinping, they start saying, the time has come, no more biding, no more hiding. We go out now, we remake the world order with Chinese characteristics in ways to our liking, which... Um, I, I got to say, I, I think that was a huge strategic mistake. Just thinking about it now you know, as a Chinese actor, not whether I want to see China take over the world or anything, but if I were in Beijing, it was my job to make China take over the world. Would I think that was a good idea? And I do say, I must say, I do think it was a mistake. And I think if they stopped biding and hiding in the 2030s rather than the 2010s, I think they would have found all of this way easier. Interesting. So to, to bring the conversation back to Britain, um, as I was reading your book, two kind of counter cases, I guess, popped to my mind, or two parallels, I guess, to Britain in history. One is like the classic pairing, France. France, it seems as though should have had, based on its geographical features, kind of an opposite history to England. It's got mostly, mostly landlocked, other than sort of the little part that borders Britain. Um, and it's got super powerful you know, super powerful rivals kind of on every side. Um, and you talk about the importance of this counterscarp to Britain. And in the case of France, you're like, gosh, that would have to be a really large counterscarp um, as it kind of has had to be throughout history. And yet in the end, as you've said, France and Britain kind of end on, on similar terms. Britain and France both wind up having to pull out of large transatlantic empires and they wind up kind of in the same camp. And the other parallel that came to my mind is Japan, which seems to me like it should be kind of the Asian version of England. It's an island nation. Mm, it's yes. off the coast of a really powerful, intimidating mainland. It seems as though it doesn't have a lot of natural resources. And then it rises to kind of imperial prominence. So I'm wondering, kind of looking at those two test cases in which it seems like France and England should wind up differently and yet wind up more or less the same. Um, Whereas Japan, also an island, winds up on the opposite side of England, kind of in, in the greatest global struggle in history in World War II. What does geography have to say about that? Why, why would history have come together in that particular way? Yeah, great question. I think these comparisons are always where the real the real stuff comes out into the open. And yeah, because the, the Japanese one is so fascinating because it for quite a long time, people did think Japan was turning into the Asian Britain. And the Japanese, some of the Japanese themselves were very, very keen on this. There's even a proposal at one point that they make English the national language in Japan. Uh, and again, for exactly the reasons you're talking about, the geographical situation, um, the needs to build up naval power to have any sort of chance of surviving. And um, Japan really seemed to be going down the British road. The, the 
famously the first actual binding naval alliance the British ever made was in 1902 with Japan. And uh, a lot of British people like to think of Japan as their sort of little Asian brother, in a rather patronizing kind of way, but their ally on whom they could depend. This was the point of the alliance, that the Japanese will take over the security of the North um, Northwest Pacific for us, so we, the British, mm. don't have to do that anymore, because everything they want as a trading maritime insular nation, everything they want is what we want. So this is going to only go well and of course it ends up not going well for much larger set of reasons you know, largely to do with the outcome of the first world war um but yeah that that is a, a really striking analogy and um, because the japanese when they start going down the imperialist path that puts them on this collision course of the united states and the european colonial powers they do still think of themselves as doing the british thing this is what the british did too the british went out in the teeth of much more powerful um european empires in the 17th and 18th centuries and beat them all down and we can do that so i think right up till 1945 i, I would say probably this is a big thing in japanese strategic thinking this idea doing like the British did, but better. And then it's defeated so devastatingly in 1945. That is simply off the table for ever and ever, or, or at least as close as ever as we get with historical things. The French case, yeah, again, really strange, the similarities and the differences with what happens there. And I think if... Um, if a few things had gone a little bit differently, it could have been France rather than Britain that became the, the global hegemon in the 18th, 19th centuries. And you know, there were points in the 18th century wars where the French were not far away from victory. And I guess that actually the big point where it could have gone very differently was in 1690. Um, Louis XIV's fleet batters the English and Dutch fleets to pieces, really. And England is completely open. He could have invaded. It's got this new regime, this usurped power violently two years earlier a lot of people think that Dutch invaders have seized the English throne if Louis had wanted to invade England he could have done and very probably would have overthrown the government installed French puppet state but he had better things to do England just wasn't important enough to him much better to keep sending his armies into Belgium to fight against the Dutch there so it could easily have gone very very differently mm. And um, as you say, your France's geographical position is distinctly different from Britain's in that it's always got its eye um, on uh, people to the, the south and to the east because they are much more scary than the British most of the time. And um, in order to become an alternate reality where you get the French Empire bestriding the world like a colossus instead of the British, they would have to have achieved, I mean, basically the, the goal that Louis XIV set himself at the end of the 17th century, achieve land-based dominance, smash up everybody so badly they can no longer threaten you, and then you can concentrate all your resources on strangling the British, um, which of course is again what Napoleon tries to do, and he comes, in some ways he comes even closer um, than any of the earlier French guys. So again, yeah, I think there's a there is an easy to imagine counterfactual world in which it could have been the French who come out on top in Europe rather than the British in the 19th century. It wouldn't have been the same world, except now we all talk about Paris rather than London. It, you know, it would have been different because of France's position on the continent, no doubt about that. But um, yeah, it's like, again, this whole thing about what does it mean to say that geography is destiny? Um, I think it means geography sets the limits on what you can do and provides the opportunities on what you might do. But then it's up to you to decide whether you're going to take advantage of these things. So I know we're just about at time. Will you permit me one final question to wrap it all up? <laughs> Please. <laughs> so for most classicists, uh, and you're a very notable exception to this, but for most classicists, the end of history is the fall of Rome. Uh, but there are plenty of people who've predicted the end of history in a more literal sense, notably Francis Fukuyama in his book of the same name, and in fact, Karl Marx, and to some extent, Nietzsche as well. So my question for you to, to cap this off is, can history end? Or specifically, when people think, uh, people think that the pace of technological innovation is such that geography will be rendered obsolete. So I guess, first, do you think that's possible? And second, if it did happen, would that kind of in your book finally be the end of history? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. Interesting question. Yeah, I think because um, if you're going to talk about the end of history, uh, then you also have to think about what is the start of history? I think if you've got to have some idea of what you mean when you talk about history. And I think often um, the sort of 
end of history, the, the champions at the end of history. They're a little bit vague about what history actually right. is. And so, I mean, I, I would say that history, it becomes meaningful to talk about history when you get human beings more or less like us in the world, which is something that um, anthropologists debate bitterly. They're very quarrelsome lot, debate bitterly about when that happened. But it's sort of somewhere between about 45,000 years ago and maybe 300,000 years ago, across that period, you start to get animals that behave in ways that are increasingly like mm. us. And if that's the beginning of history, then the end of history will be a world where that's no longer the case. And that, um, when Frank Fukuyama talked about the end of history, he obviously was talking about something very, very different. He's talking about the end of ideological conflict, which um, I, as much as I admire that, that book, I would say that's, that's just strikes me as a really peculiar yeah. definition yeah, of yeah. history. It's yeah, a yeah. funny way to look at it. And it um, but it's a good title for a book, yeah. so you know, all, all is forgiven. <laughs> Can't fault that. <laughs> and, and Marx, of course, Marx, again, a different sort of end of history, the, the end of class struggle, the creation of a world, um, a, so a socialist world run by, by and for the proletariat. And so all kinds of things go away, but thinking human beings very much don't go away so again i think that's just a very different way of thinking about history um and so you know, because i tend to think of history as a thing that begins with the evolution of fully modern human beings i tend to think about the end of it as being the end of fully modern human beings and um just you know, a slightly depressing thing to think about except that you know 90 percent 90 some percent of all the species of animals that have ever existed are now extinct what could possibly make us think we are the exception to the rule? We are never going to go extinct. And that is just extraordinary <laughs> piece of delusional thinking, I would say. And um, there's a number of ways that are easy to imagine that we might go extinct. The problem is, of course, um, very few species have probably been able to imagine their own extinction. So <laughs> again, no reason to think why we will be the first one that does. But uh, the obvious way we could go extinct, nuclear war. And I think there's a lot of things to worry about in the world today, global warming, all kinds of things. But nuclear war is still the number one existential threat for humanity. That is what we should all be focusing our energies on. So, yeah, that's the number one. Way we all blow ourselves up. Um, there are other ways. Uh, we could make the planet unlivable for our species, which is something that's happened over and over and over again in the past. Uh, often a species will succeed so well, as we, I think, in a lot of ways are doing so well, that you annihilate the resources on which you're based and you make the world unlivable for you. There's a great thing, gosh, I should remember the numbers, but it's hundreds of millions of years ago now in the past, they call the oxygen apocalypse, mm. where... Um, little bacteria are so successful uh, mm. sucking in carbon and spitting out oxygen so successful they change the chemical balance of the atmosphere and they make themselves right. go extinct <laughs> um you know it's a slightly alarming uh, analogy spring to mind on that one but then there's other ways too and like when you think about other kinds of human beings that existed before we came along and took over the entire planet um, they basically went extinct by having sex and having babies who had random mutations on their genes, some of which were adaptatively advantageous and spread through the gene pool. And the animal, the, the, uh, the Neanderthal or the Denisovan or whichever kind of uh, pre-modern human you want to talk about, the animal started turning into a different kind mm. of animal. And yeah, you know, we, um, you know, our lives are changed more by cultural evolution than by biological evolution. Our, you know, the cultures we create evolve a lot faster than our physical biology. But our biology is continuing to evolve. We are not the same animals we were 50,000 years ago. And all th other things being equal, we will continue down this path and we will gradually change into a different kind of animal. And at some point, you know, biologist defines a species by saying a kind of animal that can't interbreed with other kinds of animals. Humans will change into something different from what we are now. This is, I think this is just inevitable. But then the last one, the one that uh, is in a way most kind of funky and weird to think about, is that to say, well, OK, yeah, other species turned into something else through biological evolution, because that was the the um process in which they were most prominently involved and we are doing that too but we've also created cultural evolution we've created things outside ourselves that have changed our world changed who we are because they kind of feed back into our biological evolution you know people um lots of people now are running around having babies who would have been dead at their age essentially <laughs> ago yeah they didn't have a pacemaker implanted whatever they'd be dead they wouldn't be continuing to input into the gene pool we've already having our technology feeding back into the gene pool but i think we're at the verge now where this is going to expand 
explode in the coming hundred years, I think, to the point where I, I mean, if I were able to come back in a hundred years time, I'm not sure I want to, if <laughs> I were, um, I think I would find humanity had turned into something absolutely different from what we are now. And the, the obvious way is, of course, through uh, the various kinds of genetic manipulation that we're now developing. And um, then I think it's perfectly possible that we we are sort of beginning to fuse ourselves with the machines that we made as well, with the computing technology in particular. And um, again, I wouldn't be totally surprised if we move into a world where more and more, I mean, people already say more and more, our lives have moved onto digital platforms. Space is not what it was. Like I say, geography doesn't mean what it did in the past. And in some ways, it doesn't mean as much as it did in the past, as distance is dissolved by digital platforms. Um, yeah, I think you don't have to be a wild futurist to imagine a world in which that goes much, much further than it already has. Mm. And I would say that the last hundred years have already seen more change in what it is to be human than the previous hundred thousand years did. And you think if we could bring people you know, living a hundred years ago, drop them down in our age now, so much about us would astonish them that we are, you know, we're four inches taller on average than people were 100 years ago. We live on average more than 30 years longer. Um, we've got teeth, <laughs> and our teeth might all be made out of plastic compounds and stuff, but we got <laughs> teeth. You know, I'm now in my, my 60s, my early 60s, I hasten to add. But you know, I can go out, haul, I, you know, I live up in the Santa Cruz Mountains, always cutting down trees and hauling stuff around. I can haul this wood around. You know, my granddad couldn't have done this when he was 62. He was a steel worker, he could not have done this. We changed our bodies in so many ways already, but this is just scratching the surface. So I guess I would say we are, I, I, I would guess we are confronting the end of history, probably within your lifetime, not mine, but yours. Maybe in a good way, maybe in a bad way. Maybe we will blow ourselves up in a nuclear war. Maybe you will be beamed up to some giant database in the sky. <laughs> Who knows? But I think you're, by the time you come to the end of your three score years plus wow. 10, and then the next hundred you live on top of that, um, it's going to be a different planet. Wow, easy for you to say, Ian. Yes, I mean, it is. <laughs> I'm the one who's now got to deal with that knowledge for the next however many years. <laughs> but what a really interesting and thought-provoking note to end on. And it, it sort of is emblematic of what I love about your work and your thought in general, your ability to kind of tie the very, very, very beginnings of things in with the very, very end of them. And not, not everyone cares to take that kind of long view. And it's really interesting and instructive the way they were able to do so. So thank you so much for taking the time. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's great to have a chance to talk again. Well, there you have it, Madisonians. Professor Ian Morris on Britain's place in the world and how geography impacts history. The link to his book is in our show notes. Don't forget to follow us. And if the spirit moves, leave us a rating or review. Our website is jmp.princeton.edu. Our Twitter handle is at Madison Program, and you can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time here on Madison's Notes. Mm -hmm.